A train that goes to 360 kph uses twice the energy of a train that goes to 200 kph. Much of the uh, travel that's predicted to be on, uh, on HS2 will be either new journeys or switches from classic rail. In addition to that, because the stations are so very few, there will be a great deal of increased travel to the HS2 stations. Even the government says that HS2 will be carbon neutral at best. There are worse scenarios than that that we might come on to in discussion. In my next slide, so the next of the three words is jobs. Uh, and I'm taking up here, I think, one or two of the points that Martin was making. Uh, Imperial College, in work for HS2 Limited, uh, made it very clear that the research consensus was that new drop creation by high-speed rail is liable to be very small indeed. And indeed, in the consultation papers, the government only makes very limited claims for the jobs that HS2 will create, compared, for example, with those made by uh, KPMG for, for Green Game. So they talk about, government talks about 40,000 jobs over 10 to 15 years, of which 10,000 will be temporary in construction, and many of the rest will be relocating from other places to uh, near the stations where the majority of the new permanent jobs will be. Bear in mind, contrast those figures with the fact that the North-South divide is widening in employment terms by about 70,000 a year at the moment. So you can see how small the job creation that uh, associated with HS2 is going to be. And then thirdly, let me come on to Birmingham. And following on from those uh, comments about job creation generally, and this again is from the government consultation uh, papers, of the 30,300 projected permanent jobs, 22,000 will in fact be in London, and only 8,000 will be around the two Birmingham stations. So, and that's the figure government is using rather than Centro's figure of 22,000. So, what HS2 will do is rebalance the economy further towards London. Birmingham might get a bit, but I hope we're concerned here not just with Birmingham, but with the whole of the region and what's, what's in store for the rest of the region. No projected gains, possible relocations towards the two Birmingham stations. This really is a big city stitch up in regional jobs. <laughs> and if I conclude with uh, a comment from the very recent sustainability. Uh, uh, Sustainable Development Commission's work on HS2, their view is there are much more urgent priorities for public transport funding than this. Thank you. Uh, Jim Stitt. Thank you. Um, High Speed 2 is uh, the line which is proposed to link London <laughs> and Birmingham and beyond. Uh, of course, it, it serves Birmingham actually on the branch, so it, it's not a bad place to be. Uh, but most of the benefits uh, it's projected will actually arise from those using high speed two, and I'm not talking about the wine end, I'm talking about high speed two, to travel between places further north than the West Midlands and London. Um, Beyond High Speed 2, government has made very clear it sees the rollout of a national high speed rail network which it sees taking a Y form with, with Birmingham, the Birmingham Interchange Station being the, the pivotal point. I just said that just in case, I mean, you're clearly a highly informed audience, but there might be one or two people who just wonder what we're talking about. A scheme that will open in 2026 if um, government decides to proceed following the consultation which runs to July and we're expecting ministerial decisions at the end of this year. Um, Green Gauge 21 has a public interest group and I'd just like to use a short part of my time allocation to explain what that is. That's a group of 
mainly public sector bodies, but also representative bodies from the rail industry, but largely it's been city councils and regional authorities. And they put together funding to do research actually in the period before government uh, committed to do high-speed rail and since. Um, we have uh, basically therefore set out to look at and make the case for high-speed rail. And my personal interest in doing that stemmed from having seen earlier studies done 10 years ago, which made it very clear that if you looked at the options, this was the better thing to do. Government was sitting on that report. And while many people uh, say, ah, well, the business case doesn't stack up, just for the record, um, in <coughs> Department for Transport terms, using what I would see as being the standard set of assumptions, and many of them are, are really quite cautious, it does stack up. It's still, despite a downward revision to the impact of the recession, technically a good business case. Now, I know many people wish it wasn't, and many people will argue against that. But that's the, the published starting point. OK, so the two key questions, um, the, the questions for today that have been posed, the one is the green question, and the second is the jobs question. Just on jobs. The core cities group, which comprises Newcastle, Leeds, Sheffield, Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, Nottingham, Bristol, and England and Cardiff, in Wales, Edinburgh, Glasgow, recently reconfirmed their support for high-speed rail and for high-speed 2, together with their chambers of commerce. So, yeah, whoever said, oh, well, this is a stitch-up um, when um, the comment was made about cities, this is about connecting cities. But it's also about freeing up capacity on the existing rail network. And there are big opportunities around for all of us and all of the communities, including those between London and Birmingham, from the capacity that gets liberated. And capacity is the key word. And so, of course, there'll be debates about the growth forecast and all the rest of it. But really, on quite modest assumptions, uh, that capacity is going to be needed. I haven't yet seen anybody produce a better alternative that quite honestly can't be knocked down quite easily. Of course, people would like to find a cheaper, a less uh, apparently uh, damaging in local terms uh, scheme. And in green terms, well, we're going to have uh, an interesting debate on this point. Uh, the evidence we have is that high-speed trains running on high-speed lines, certainly at 300 kilometers an hour, and I'll grant you above that position where you say make, uh, mm -hmm. uh, emit no more carbon than existing trains, like the Pendolino I came on from London, travel at two thirds of that speed. So um, the green argument and the carbon argument is, is a complex one, but uh, it's by no means a, a simple mathematical, it's bound to be a lot more. Well, that's Jim, thank you. several books about them, which are on sale over there, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm happy to sign and sell afterwards. Um, so I make my living from uh, promoting the railways. I'm often doing on the radio, kind of defending the railways. So why am I against this? You know, why have I looked at the evidence and thought, no, I just can't support it? I mean, I would love to support it, but essentially this is a car project. We don't generally do them in the UK. It's quite interesting that all the parties have got behind this. But it is. It, it's, it's, you know, something rather rudely one could say, really, way. You know, it's all about uh, the fact that uh, the politicians say that you know, there is a, a, a problem here and we're going to solve it by throwing 17 billion, possibly quite a lot more, uh, amount of money at it. But when you start looking at the case of it, it really does uh, fall apart. I won't particularly address the green bits uh, because I think those have been addressed. Uh, to some extent already, except to say, you know, one of the uh, real uh, 
false claims for this is that it'll take aeroplanes out of the sky and people will use the trains and stuff. It really won't. Uh, and indeed, even uh, you know, running from say here to Paris, uh, you know, the, the, the case for the HS2 put out by the government can only justify possibly one or two trains per day, and it really uh, you know, would not be much uh, value and quite possibly unlikely to happen because that might just not be worthwhile in terms of the amount of, of trains that we'd, uh, we'd have. Um, there's an awful lot of other questions. Is it affordable? And can we really do this at a time uh, you know, when you know, we can't pay for lollipop ladies in Dorset or whatever, you know, they're all getting cut, and we want to spend a billion pounds on this in this uh, parliament and two billion pounds a year uh, thereafter? Will it be affordable to the ordinary public? You know, we already have very high train fares. Train fares are going up by inflation plus three percent <coughs> For the next three years, the base costs, uh, uh, you know, when this opens, will be absolutely horrendous. We don't do cheap train fares in this country. You know, the Treasury has insisted on premium rates on the first high-speed line. You know, so you actually pay extra to use that. You can be sure that people will have to pay extra for this. So it will be, to some extent, a rich man's railway. And you know, it wants to encourage people. The promoters of this want to encourage people commute between London and Birmingham. Is there anything more nonsensical than that? Encouraging people to travel 120 miles, 240 miles a day on very pricey railway, using very ex lot of resources. It, it absolutely does not make uh, any coherent sense. You know, it will encourage people uh, to travel more than they are uh, uh, at the moment. Um, because that's the nature of it. You know, it. It actually has to do that to justify the business case. But even then, the business case, as Jim knows, is weak. Business cases are based on very complex, uh, largely mathematical formula uh, based on the idea that if you save time, uh, you are worth a certain amount of money uh, per, uh, <coughs> per hour. And it's actually calibrated in such a way that, you know, if you're uh, a businessman doing something, you work more than the tourist doing something. And, and they, they add up all these little incremental savings of time, uh, and they multiply that by a big number, like by saying, you know, X million are going to use this. And they say, that's the business case for it. You know, that's how uh, we can justify uh, the expense. Now, Jim is in that business. He runs a, a consultancy called Steer Davis Glee. There's a lot of very good work, but he did this calculation for HS1 uh, many years ago and uh, found that it was a fantastic business case because it was based on twice the number of people who were actually using HS1. So I know it's a bit below the belt, uh, uh, Jim, to use past the word research because uh, you know, uh, we all get things wrong, even I as a journalist occasionally get things wrong, uh, but uh, you know, the case for HS1 could not be proved retrospectively, and the case for HS2 cannot be proved. Thank you. But as I mentioned, we've had a few questions uh, submitted, and uh, just so that we can get through as many of these questions, and there aren't too many of them, and as many of your questions as we possibly can, uh, and I've explained this to the panellists, I'm going to take a representative pro and a representative anti in, re in answer to each question, unless there's a particular demand for all of them to answer, just so we can keep the, the debate and the discussion moving as quickly as possible, uh, and as coherently as possible. Uh, 